Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and welcome to the show. Uh, my name is Yusuf Chambers. I'm going to be talking about a very important topic which we were talking about in previous episodes, which is a system called Go Rap. In other words, brother, would you like to explain it? Assalamu alaikum, by the way. <laughs> wa alaikum as wa <laughs> Explain yourself. What is Go, go rap. rap? Okay. Well, as we explained uh, at the end of the last episode, GORAP stands for God, Oneness, Revelation and Prophethood. Mm -hmm. And essentially it's a framework for giving da'wah. And what I mean by framework is you don't have to follow this rule rigidly. It's, there is flexibility in there, but it provides a path for you to go through in your conversation that you need to hit certain key points in your conversation for your conversation to have any benefit in it, i.e. to be calling the person. So. The idea is simply this. So the, 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 if there's a difficult question, if there's a difficult question, instead of answering it, yep. well, answering well, it absolutely directly, yep. how would you initiate the discussion? Because well, this is like, quite that's, an that's what I was actually coming to. Oh, really? Yeah, I was. So I was going to say this is how You were going to initiate, were you? I wasn't going to initiate. I was going to get, get you to give me an example of a difficult question. Oh, yes, a, a difficult question. Let me think <coughs> of, in my mind's eye, whether I can ask, ask something very difficult about Islam. Okay. All right, mate. Yeah, so you say that you believe in God, yeah? Yeah. So why do you sell alcohol in all your shops and, and sell drugs in the street then, you Muslims? <laughs> I've seen you do it. Not you, but I've seen your mates do it. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> okay. That's a good question. Okay, so regardless of the question, I mean, there are some questions that generally you'd probably want to answer the question directly. Mm. For example, that one, I would probably skip the whole go-rap and I would answer that question directly and just say, look, that's nothing to do with Islam. But generally speaking, yeah, you, what you would do is you would thank the person for the question mm. and you would explain to them that, look, for them to understand <coughs> the answer, they need to understand a little bit about Islam first. Mm. Now, why are we going through this approach? The answer is simply this. Mm. You've got to put yourself, remember as we spoke about in uh, previous episodes, mm -hmm. the, the curse of knowledge. You remember with, yeah. the, with that, uh, the extreme Muslim who, when he's yeah. given down, you've got to implement everything about Islam if you want yeah. to be a Muslim. Why? Because he has a certain mindset. He's, he's viewing the world through a certain set of goggles, if you want. Yeah. Like he sees mm -hmm. things according to the Islamic values. Whereas the people who are coming to Islam from external ideologies, mm -hmm. they will see the world according to different sets of values. Yeah. Even though you may be using the same language, the same dialogue, you will be having a completely different discussion because your, your reference points are completely different. Mm -hmm. So what we need to do is get the other person, the not yet Muslim, to understand what our position is in order to understand the answer. Mm -hmm. the let me try again then. Okay. Let me, let me start well, again. Okay. Yeah? Shall, I, shall I give you a question? Which is you, can you can give me a question, but I was just going to explain. Oh, you finish off and I'll give you. Because, you know, we've got to make this real for the guys out there. They've yeah, got will, to understand. Yeah, yeah, we will because make, we will they're make all real. going to face these questions at course, some time in their life. Yeah? We, we will make this real. But okay, the go. fundamental point that they need to understand is, look, the not yet Muslim is not going to understand Islam. They don't know anything about Islam. So they don't know why is it that we Muslims, we do the things no, that they we do. No, but they know. That's not true, is it? They do know lots about Islam okay, from Sheikh Google they do. and from the BBC and they from do. Channel 4 and from Wikipedia. They There's do. another one. Yeah. They do. But they also view Islam as some kind of a make-believe fairy tale. You know, mm. uh, you know they, we, we see this all the time where atheists, they liken you know, a belief in God to a belief, a belief in the, uh, the tooth fairy or pixies at the bottom of the garden. And the reality is it's nothing like that. <coughs> so... So long as they approach Islam from that mindset where it's just complete fantastical rubbish, mm -hmm. they will never give any credibility to the weight of your answer. So they will never give any credibility to the weight of your answer. So what we need to do is to get them to remove their goggles, if you were, remove their worldview, reset their position and understand the way we look at the world. Once they understand the way we look at the world and why, they'll begin to understand the answers. And that's why we have to take them all the way back. You know, don't answer the question directly, unless, mm -hmm. of course, you know, in some cases you have to, but that's up to your own judgment. Take them all the way back and explain to them that, look, you need to understand Islam first, then you'll understand 
why we do things the way we do. And that will, inshallah, answer all a lot of questions in one go. Okay. So let's try again. Let, let's, let's try again. Okay. Let's, let's ask one which we know is going to uh, okay. resonate with your system. Yeah? Yeah. Okay. So, uh, excuse me, mate. Hello. Hello. Um, I've got a problem with Islam, man. All right. Yeah, I've got a real problem with it. Okay, what's that then? Why do you cut people's hands off all the time? And stone people to death ah, and kill them. Okay, all right. I I understand. I can see why it seems like uh, that's the case. Um, so I understand the reason why you're asking that question, and I and I can see how it would appear to be that way. But that's not actually the case. So if you've got a few minutes, uh, what I'd like to do. Hold on a minute. I've got, I mean, I've read it in the newspaper. You cut in hands, chopping necks. Yeah. Taliban. Yep. You're all Al Qaeda. <laughs> you're doing all this stuff. Yep, yep, yep. The, I'll admit, there is parts of that that are from Islam. Oh. But for you to understand the methodology, why that happens, I need to teach you a little bit about Islam first. So if you've got a few minutes, uh, yeah. I'd be happy to do that. Oh. Do you have a few minutes? Well, um, suppose I, suppose I do, but I was just, I was just gonna be about to go and get lunch, actually. It only take a few minutes. I mean, well, do you really want to know the answer, or do you just want to make that statement and go? Because you asked me the question, so now it comes yeah. down to, do you want to know the answer? At the yeah, end well, I suppose, yeah. Okay, so this is yeah. an important thing here. We have, to, as well as acknowledging the question and mentioning that, you know, we need to tell the person a little mm -hmm. bit about Islam, always ask them, do they have the time? Do they have a few minutes? And there's a lot of benefits for this. Number one, first of all, it's the easiest way to weed out time wasters. Because at mm -hmm. the end of the day, if someone just wants to come and give you some <coughs> aggravation, you ask them, do you have a few minutes to talk? They're not going to want to talk and they're just going to storm mm. off. So you don't need to answer them. At the end of the day, you know, it's, it's uh, no waste of your time. Yeah. Number two, it's also courteous because they may genuinely be busy. They may be expecting a quick answer uh, and they may be busy. So again, it's courteous to say, look, I want to take a few minutes of mm. your time. You know, is that fine? And mm. the third part, the th third reason is you get that buy-in. Because once they've said to you that, yeah, I have got a few minutes, I want to know the answer, they've bought into your answer. Mm. They've bought into that time. So they, when you're going to be speaking to them now, they're going to mm. invest and listen to you properly. Why? It, because they said it. And you're also getting them psychologically into that whole process of agreement. And, and also you're, you're in the box seat now. Because they, they were yep. in the box seat. <laughs> Indeed. They were doing the chatting. And now you're yep. doing the chatting and they're doing the listening, right? Yep. So, so this is a psychological... Uh, yep barrier broken down there straight away, right? Indeed. You, I mean, the, the other aspect as well is, regardless of how aggressive or something like that the person comes, just keep calm and you'll mm. find that if you retain a calm demeanor, they'll eventually calm down as well. Mm -hmm. So again, the idea is not to, to start shouting at them and things like that. It's basically to, to remain calm. Obviously, dawah is situational. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I mean, the way you would give dawah to a normal person you just bump into on the street or in the supermarket mm -hmm. is quite different to maybe how you'd give dawah to the same person at, say, Hyde Park, which is very mm -hmm. loud, very noisy. Um, but specifically in the context of a masjid, which is uh, where most of the where we want to try and focus our things on, generally it should be very quiet, mm -hmm. uh, and you should have the opportunity to speak to people. So we just need yeah. to bring everything back to Islam and explain the whole Qur'an procedure. So now at this point in time in the conversation, <coughs> the person, they've asked you that question, it doesn't matter what the question is, but you've said to them, look, I need to explain Islam to you. Yeah. This is the starting point of the Qur'an. So what we've just done is called initiation, where you've acknowledged their question, you've um, <coughs> asked them for their time. So what we've just done now is called the initiation, and it's the precursor to the Qur'an um, framework. Mm -hmm. So we've Ask, we've uh, acknowledged the person's question and we've asked them for a few minutes of their time. At this point as well, it's good to you know, shake hands, uh, obviously if it's the same mm. gender, and ask the person their name. Um, but you've basically broken down the, any forms of barriers or obstacles that were there from mm. giving you that in the first place. And now we can start to enter into the whole Gora procedure. Mm. So as I mentioned, it stands for God, Oneness, Revelation and Prophethood. The first step is to establish do they believe in a creator of the universe? Because mm. if they don't believe in a creator of the universe, they're not going to believe in anything else. They're not going to believe in a divine script. They're not going to believe in messengership and things like that. So we have to start off with a basic uh, mm. 
belief that the universe had a creator. Now, there's a couple of different ways that we can do that, and we can explore both uh, after the break, but there's a, a philosophical uh, perspective that we can use, which uh, is a favorite of mine, but there's also, um, you know, uh, for example, a story uh, an mm -hmm. where you can use an analogy, a, a real-life yeah. analogy as well to come to the creator mm -hmm. of the universe. Yeah. So there are many different ways that you can establish each one of these points, and it's really left up to the person to, to pick whichever one they feel comfortable with. Mm -hmm. That's why I said the whole Gorap thing, uh, the whole Gorap framework is just that, it's a framework. If you prefer a particular technique to explain that there is a creator, if you prefer a particular technique yep. to explain the Quran, by all means use it. Mm -hmm. The whole point is that you need to go through this method first to build up that sequence of events to get the person to accept Islam as the truth, inshallah, and once they've accepted, then all the questions go away. So I think after the break, then we might go through a couple of examples of how mm. to explain there is a creator of the universe. Something to do with the universe anyway, isn't it? What do you mean? Well, there has to be, if there's a universe, right? Yeah. Then there has to be an answer to who put this universe here, right? So you're going to... Oh. Talk yeah, about that so that, yeah, so that's what we're going we're gonna to go through a couple of different techniques to explain, right. okay. to establish. I mean, for obviously, as Muslims, we believe that there is a creator. The point is, how can we mm. uh, demonstrate that? And furthermore, how can we demonstrate it with conviction, where it's not just faith? Mm -hmm. You know, other people have faith in their religion because they can't mm. back it up. Whereas we, as Muslims, if we have the haq, if we have the truth, we should be able to demonstrate it. Okay, so that, that seems very reasonable. And it's also a very reasonable point in the discussion to take a commercial break. See you after the break, inshallah. Asalaamu As Alaikum. So welcome back um, after the break. I hope you enjoyed the break. Asalaamu Alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. And we're going to be continuing our discussion with uh, Sheikh Jamshidi. <laughs> it's not Sheikh. <laughs> it's not really. Well, I mean, you know, Sheikh out of respect. Okay. Shake. <laughs> <laughs> right. Okay. Right. So we were talking about the issue of <coughs> trying to explain to a non-Muslim person or not yet Muslim yep. um, <coughs> about the universe. Yeah. Okay. So as I mentioned, there are two different ways to go about this. Um, the two different ways that we'll probably discuss are a philosophical perspective mm -hmm. and also uh, an ex uh, a practical example as well. So I'll go with a philosophical perspective first because that's a favorite of mine. The reason why mm. I like this one is simply because <clears throat> it comes down to two basic questions. And the reality is once you, you understand what these two questions mean, the outcome is unescapable. Mm. Even if you want to be ridiculous, you can't escape from the outcome. Yeah. So the first question is simply to ask, I mean, we assume, obviously, that the universe is here and it's real. Yeah. We're going to be a little bit reasonable here. Uh, and it's a good question. It's, it's good also... Uh, but, but, but hold on a minute. Let's just break that. Because you've done yeah. initiation, but don't yeah. we have to ex get them to accept? Yeah, I was going to come back to that, actually. You were going to come back to that, I was going to come you? back to that. Are I you sure? I, I was sure. I mean, this <laughs> that's where I was going to. <laughs> so we're going to discuss uh, a couple of different techniques to uh, establish that there must be a creator of the universe. Now, one thing that we didn't cover before the break, uh, which should be including as, uh, included as part of the initiation, is an agreement to be reasonable. Because unfortunately, you know, you, we find uh, people out there who just want to have an argument for the sake of having an argument. Uh, and I mean, and I don't mean an argument with like raised voices, but I mean an argument in terms of an intellectual sense. Yeah. Um, but we need to be reasonable. We can't believe in things that we, we can't back up or that we can't mm. support because that is not conducive to divorce discussion. So we need to get an agreement from them that look, are we gonna have a reasonable, rational discussion? Are we gonna base our approach on common sense and evidence and you know collective human experience, for example? And there are a couple of diff different ways that we can, uh, a couple of different examples by which we can demonstrate what we mean. Uh, so an example that I hear use widely is uh, a story called The Man in the Red Underpants, where we uh, suppose that a man wearing nothing but red underpants comes to your door, and he inquires about your gas meter. So a technique that I hear use in this regard is a story called The Man in the Red Underpants. Oh, yes. And 
the way this story works is that we explain to the person, look, if a man came to your door wearing nothing but red underpants and he inquired as to your gas meter, would you let that person in? No, I wouldn't. And this is generally the answer. I mean, you do find a couple of weirdos that would let the person in, but then you need to really poke them upon them. But generally speaking, the person wouldn't let this guy in. Why? Because he doesn't appear to be from the gas board. Because he's not wearing the uniform, he's probably got no identification. Yeah. Especially, you know, if he's come at midnight, for example, it's not the correct time. Basically, everything is wrong. You could argue that, yeah, there is a small, tiny chance that he is legitimate and maybe he got robbed or they've changed their uniform and, you know, their new working hours are 2 a.m. in the morning till 3 a.m. in the morning. You could argue that. You know, there is, a, there is that possibility, but the reality is most people would reject this. And this is what a reasonable person would do. So we're not calling for anything more than this. We're just calling for people to use their common sense and come to the most logical, rational deduction. So that's something else to include as part of the initiation. So now, when we uh, come to establishing whether there's a creator, there's two uh, different ways that you can do it. You can do it through a philosophical means, which is the, the method that I prefer personally. Uh, or you can go through an analogy. So let's go through the, uh, the philosophical perspective first. Mm. The reason why I prefer this one is <clears throat> it boils down to just two questions. And once you've understood these two questions and their possible outcomes, it doesn't really matter how unreasonable a person wants to be because you can't escape the conclusion i.e. there must be a creator. Unless they run away, of course. Unless they run away, of course, which unfortunately is what a lot of people have taken to. Because they... <laughs> seriously... So I've actually seen quite a few people run away from Dow stalls, yes. <laughs> Once in they've fact, been, you know, uh, you know, approached in this manner. In fact, actually, do you know, uh, we went to Norway. Yes. And one of the videos that we did was... I was there with you. Yeah, I know. That's why I said we went to Norway. Um, sorry. But one of the videos we produced, I don't know if you remember, we were producing Can't daily we logs. can put some of that footage in? We could put some of that footage in because we have it all. I'm sure that okay. we could. Anyway, okay. go on. Anyway, so we went to Norway, uh, as you know, and we released daily videos. Uh, and one of the days we released a collection of um, Dawa bites, i.e. Mm. some interesting conversations. And in one of the videos where uh, our colleague uh, Imran, who was there with us, was uh, giving shahada to someone, mm. you can see me in the background. I'm having a conversation with someone else about exactly this philosophical approach to whether there's a creator. And you can see the guy getting frustrated because he wanted to escape the answer, but he couldn't mm. explain why not. And he just basically shouted and said, I've had enough. And he <laughs> ran away. SubhanAllah. <laughs> but that's why, I mean, I love this one because realistically, you can't escape the outcome regardless of how obtuse you are, unless you literally escape. Mm. So what are the questions? The first question, and I'll go through the two questions uh, briefly, just mm. so we understand what the approach is. And then I'll go through what are the... The <coughs> well, what, well, what do we say if the person takes the wrong answer, basically, if they okay. want to be silly about it? So the first question is, did this universe have a beginning? Now, naturally, the only answer is, or the only two answers are yes or no. Mm. And we would establish, we would try to say, well, then, well then, the answer, <laughs> that uni the universe did have a beginning. Well, there are some people who say yes and no. <laughs> really? I've, ne I've never, <laughs> I've heard of I've never had that. that. Anyway, I've but, never but what you're that. saying, proposing, of course, yeah. makes logical sense. Yeah, and, you have, and also bear in mind the way that the question is worded. Did it have a beginning? There, there is only the, the two yeah. possible answers. Mm -hmm. Okay, and the second question then would be, did the universe create itself? Mm -hmm. Okay, so regarding the first question, did the universe have a beginning? Now, we need to be careful here. We're not talking about, is the universe very, very old or anything like that? What we're trying to establish is, was there a point in time where the universe didn't exist and now it does? Yeah. And the answer to that can only be either yes, that's what happened, or no. Uh, an answer, you know, it's not suitable for a person to say, I don't know, because that only relates to his own knowledge about the matter. It doesn't change the two yeah. possible answers there are. Yeah. So let's explore both. Mm -hmm. Let's just say, for example, the universe didn't have a beginning. Yeah. Okay? So if the person answers no, the universe didn't have a beginning. There are many ways we can say, well, actually, this is the false answer. Because, for example, uh, if the universe didn't have a beginning, it would imply that it has an infinite history, i.e., for every historical event that's happened, there's always one preceding it, going back and back and back and back and back, all the way into infinity. And we know that that's completely impossible because infinity cannot be reached. 
Because yeah. if you consider time as, let's just say, one hour ago as minus one, and the hour before that as minus two, what you're essentially saying is time started off from minus infinity and it's mm -hmm. reached us now, which is completely impossible because nobody can count down from minus infinity. Mm -hmm. And if the universe was infinite in the past, we would not be here now. Yeah. Some people find that a little bit too complicated. So let's yeah. go with a more rational example. Everybody knows about the Big Bang. Everybody knows. I mean, this is the, the preferred scientific model of the universe. What's that? Hiroshima and Nagasaki? No, it's... <laughs> no, Combined, it's, is it? No, it's something greater than that. It's the birth of the universe. Oh, I see. Um, so this is w with regards to the expansion of... Uh, Infinitely more cataclysmic than the... Uh, well, I don't want to use that word infinite because, again, there's something uh, measurable. So... Essentially, the point we're trying to make is infin infinity doesn't exist in the real world. But with regards to the Big Bang, mm -hmm. we know the Big Bang happened because of the expansion of the stars and the planets. If you rewind the expansion of everything back, it shows that everything must have had a common starting point. Yes. And there's only so far that you can rewind everything back. Ergo, yeah. there must have been a beginning. And there are many other arguments that, or many other scientific evidences that people can use as well. Uh, for example, the second law of thermodynamics that says, you know, if the universe, uh, after a particular period of time, it will, um, the universe will encounter heat death, which is, you know, when the entire universe will die off. The fact that it's still alive now shows that it's not infinite in the past. So there are many, many different ways that this can be answered. So, yeah. so with regards to the question of, did the universe have a beginning, mm -hmm. the only rational answer can be, B, yes, it did. So now we've established that there was a point where the universe didn't exist, and it did. Now the question becomes, did the universe create itself? Mm. And this sounds like a ludicrous question, but a lot of people actually believe it did. Again, bear in mind, look at the way the question is worded. There's only yes or no. Those are the only possible answers. Even if the person says, I don't know, we could still permit it to explore the possibilities. So, But isn't that what... <coughs> anti-creationists say that it did create it did. itself. Well, okay, so let's explore the possibility. If they say, yes, it did, then what they're effectively saying is, well, let's, let's answer it by an analogy. Well, so let's say atheists. Let's, I said okay. anti-creationists, atheists. Atheists. Said, well, let's answer it by an analogy. Can a woman give birth to herself? Um, to date, I don't think there's been a case yet. There hasn't been a case, but is it physically possible? I'd say no. Okay, why not? Because she would have to have been there yeah. in order to have produced herself. Yeah. So we have a base, uh, a paradox. We have something, in this case the woman, she needs to exist to perform the creation process, yeah. and she needs to not exist to be born at the same time, mm -hmm. i.e. she needs to exist and not exist at the same time, which is completely impossible. Mm. It's exactly the same for the universe. For the universe to create itself, it needs to exist to perform creation and not exist to be created at the same time. It just mm. makes no logical sense whatsoever. Yes. And in fact, yes. it goes against everything that we could yeah. possibly imagine. It goes it, against the whole corpus of knowledge that we've uh, accumulated over Again, for anyone to hold millions and thousands and thousands of years. Again, for anyone to hold this opinion, it, it's the you know this is the feat greater than magic. You know they might as well believe in magicians putting bunny rabbits but, out of a hat. Isn't that, isn't that the position of an atheist? The atheist. I mean, very very briefly because we're <coughs> going to end the show now. Okay. But isn't that the condition of the atheist is that he has to have an awful lot of faith? That <laughs> actually, yeah, they would deny it. But uh, indeed, the position of the atheist is faith in that the universe just magically created itself from nothing, magically mm. ordered itself from nothing, and magically sustains itself from nothing. Well, you've got to have a lot of faith to believe that, haven't you? You do. My dear brothers and sisters, that was just the first in a long stream of arguments and um, a method that we, uh, we developed for Dawah, for you, to implement in your masjids across the world, inshallah. So until <laughs> the next episode, which is coming up shortly, inshallah, we will ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless you for watching this program. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.